now I hmm, now it should be better. Okay, sorry. Now I, I now I started recording. Uh, okay, so what did we do last time? Last time we proved the lemma that for each critical point P, there exists a neighborhood RP such that if a trajectory of Xi leaves this neighborhood, then it doesn't come back again to that neighborhood. Okay, so that was the statement of last theorem. And uh, as I told you, the proof of that statement gives you a flavor of what are the tools in like Morse theory. How do you, how do you think about Morse theory and not just a statement for the proof. So that was like uh, by uh, while proving this theorem, we somehow proved that something in this spirit, we didn't prove it, we didn't prove rigorously that statement, but actually it is, it was proved last time. We'll come back to that later, uh, that a limit of trajectories in a specific sense is either a again a trajectory or a broken trajectory. So that was like the main idea of that point. And now we ended up in choosing uh, an order of critical points. So we said that P is smaller than P prime. If a trajectory of Xi leaving RP, there exists a trajectory of Xi leaving RP and hitting RP prime in the future. So this was like we constructed an order on critical uh, on critical points and the way the statement that we prove that if we leave we don't come back again then it's uh, mm, uh, uh, it's uh, mm, mm, we don't come back again uh, then this is a partial order it means that p is not less than p because you can't start from p and come back to p again so that's like Hesiod, uh, Hesiod say said Herodot said, you can't enter twice the same river. Uh, uh, and just, uh, just to make sure, and in here, it's possible that there are two uh, intermediate, let's say, descendants, intermediate, uh, yes, immediate it is a, primes. It is that, a transitive, yes, uh, it is a transitive closure of the relation generated by this, if you ask yeah. me. Yeah, I mean that for given p, we can have to let's say immediate um, not siblings, neighbors that that we're reaching yes, in, in, uh, in immediate uh, uh, antecedents uh, of the of p. Yes, you can have like someone that is immediately, and then you can start from p prime mm -hmm. to p double prime. So this uh, what Martin said. Uh, this is a transitive closure of this relation. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm asking about something else. So uh, suppose that we have P prime and uh, P bis, yeah. and that if we start on the left of the point P, then we are reach, reaching uh, P prime. And if we start on the right of P, we are reaching P bis. Okay. Is it, it's, 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 it's such a thing possible here? Well, if we start on at P, no, what we start at P, and we go to p prime, yes, that's what you say. And we start at p, and we reach p double prime. We start because it's the the order is defined that if we start uh, if we're leaving our p. Yes. So p is a critical point. So if we start at p, then we are not going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, but is this next p closest p prime unique? Uh, no, it's not. No, okay. no, it's uh, uh, it's it is possible that we start at the. Let me just uh, draw it in here. That we start at the. A situation like this cannot be excluded a priori. So we start at this point. Some trajectories reach, reach here. Some trajectories reach here, and some trajectories reach here, but no trajectory goes uh, like this and reaches this point. So this is like P, this is P1, P2, P3, and we know that P is less than P2, less than P, uh, 
this is P1, yes? P2, P3 is less than uh, P1 less than P3, P is less than P2, but uh, P2, P3 are not related. Uh, are you sharing me some the, the screen? I stopped sharing. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, for some reason, I, I stopped sharing the screen. Mm. Uh, so we have now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have like a point P. We have P, neighborhood of P1, P2, and P3. And we have P going, to, a trajectory going from P to P2, from P to P1, from RP to P, to P1, not from P. And from RP to P3, the only trajectories that go from RP uh, to RP3 are uh, trajectories uh, that cross RP1. So this is reflected in these two relations and P2 and P3 are not necessarily re related. So for example, there can be no trajectories from P2 to P3 and from P3 to P2, okay? This is the, and it's not a trajectory that starts at the critical point P, but it starts, it's supposed to start at the, at the neighborhood of the critical point, so at RP. Mm -hmm. because, because otherwise, because what, what do we need it for? We define the function over here and we define the function over here. Okay, that was our our aim. We define the functions near define the function near the critical points. Because the a way of critical points we can like interpolate between two level sets. But at critical points we can't interpolate because we uh, trajectory stops at the critical point. So if the trajectory stops we need to use other tools. And uh, uh, so we interpolate uh, and we know we want to define, so we need to define originally the function f near at this point, but we need to make sure that the top level of this, if we reach from this, this neighborhood, if we reach that neighborhood, that from the top level of this, if we hit here, then the function is increasing. So it is, it's better be, it better be uh, uh, smaller here than, than over here, okay? No matter if it, there is a trajectory from, from, the, from the critical point P to the critical point P1, we, or it's just some trajectory leaving RP and hitting RP plus, RP plus, RP1, we, in both cases, we need to make sure that the function is smaller here than, than over here, because otherwise we can define, okay? That was the, that was the key point. So the key point of the of this relation is that it allows us to set the function as it's over here. The function is CP plus epsilon P. So we define the function, we choose a real number CP. And here is the condition for any PP prime, either CP plus epsilon P is smaller than this. So the RP prime neighborhood is like from the point of view, if we think of the F as a height, as a height function, it's higher than the um, higher than RP or it's below RP. So there are no like things in between. And if P is smaller than P prime in this relation, then we require that this happens. So that's because we need this. And we define the function f as a function on um, uh, in a neighborhood. Okay, so what we do? I told you, I think we stopped last talk at the case where um, um, uh, where there are no critical points between two level sets. So we proceed we proceed by induction. So we suppose that we have already defined the function up to level set A and above the level set B. So for example, if at the beginning we take the global minimum of F and the global maximum of F, 
they are both critical points. They are both most critical points. So what is the global, what do we put to be the global minimum or the global maximum? Well, it has to be a critical point of index zero of Xi in this neighborhood. Uh, mm, Mm. Mm. In, in its neighborhood, we took the smallest CP. So we take the critical point with smallest CP, we declare that it's a minimum. And if it's uh, highest CP, we declare it to be the maximum. And then the CP, then the function is declared to be defined uh, between the CP prime minus epsilon prime for the maximum and above sorry, above CP prime minus epsilon prime for maximum and below CP plus, CP plus epsilon P for the minimum. Okay, so that's our induction start. So we define, take the smallest CP and say, well, the function is here. This is like CP plus minus plus epsilon. This is our second. And now we have several, several other critical points in between. Uh, in the applications of the vector field integration lemma, we sometimes use the other version of it. So the version is that we have a function that is already defined in A and B, and the trajectory either hits a critical point or reaches this region, and then the function is defined so we don't leave out. So we will see this later, but this picture, sometimes we will come back to that picture and not to not to this statement. Okay, so come back to proof. First of all, if there are no critical, so suppose we have F, we have two level sets and uh, if we start at this point, we either reach a critical point or reach the top. So reach N plus and we don't leave out. So if there are no critical points, so if these are like absent, then we just uh, interpolate. So we define the value of the function here as the average of the values on the trajectories. So that was done last time. So we chose a point Z in, in the middle. There was some time that we reach N plus in the future, sometime that we reached n minus in the past, and we declare the function f of z to be like interpolation between along the trajectories. <clears throat> so far, so good. So what happens if we have a critical point? So this picture, I think it should be erased because it's uh, for So what happens if we have uh, this situation, let me copy it and here. So what happens? We have level set A and we have the values like P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, and we assume that CP1, so this was the constant from that, uh, from this definition on the neighborhood RP. So this is here the constant. So we have like CP1 smaller than CP2, smaller than CP5, okay? So our next step is to define F between A and CP1 minus epsilon or epsilon P1 or whatever. We can choose a common epsilon for, for, for everything so anyway. So how do we do it? Well, the idea is that we would like to take a, have a level set and take the function here and maybe I will show you the uh, uh, share the other 
picture because it's much nicer in here. Let me just uh, uh, Just one moment uh, and oh, I can do this. Uh, what's happening? Maybe I should do that. I'm okay. Five, okay. Okay, so here is a picture. Can you see the picture now? Uh, can can anybody see the picture that I'm sharing? Yes, I, I can see it. Okay. All right, so here is uh, the picture that uh, I drew for the for the paper, and it's a bit uh, more a bit better. Uh, so we have a level set because it's three dimensional. I can draw the three dimensional picture like this. So we have uh, the level set A, or A prime in this notation, and we want to have uh, to study the trajectories that reach to extend the function to the to this level set C i. C minus I plus one, which is uh, our CP one minus epsilon uh, minus epsilon one. So what do we do? We take the set of points, which is denoted by AI plus one or AI plus two and AI plus three. It's a set of points such that, such that the trajectory of Xi starting at the point AI hits the neighborhood well, it's denoted here VI, but we use the notation RI uh, in the future. So from here we reach, we you read this picture by thinking that the vector field is vertical. Okay, so that you reach, starting from here, you reach the this neighborhood. Starting from this, this neighborhood somehow overlap, you reach the other critical point. And starting from here, you reach this critical point. Okay, so now what do you want to do? You want to have uh, to take the time to consider the time to reach from this place to that place. So you take the time that you that you need to. So this is the same story as uh, as previously. So uh, you need the, you consider the time to reach from a i plus one to v i. Maybe I will redraw that picture and. Uh, uh, here is stop share and uh, mm, that's it's better to have this. Uh, so that we like look at oh. AI, here is AI plus one, here is AI plus two, and here we have the RI, here is RI plus one, and here somewhere higher, higher, higher is RI plus two. So define TI to be minimal time needed to reach <clears throat> ri from ai okay so we start from here we go along the trajectory and we reach so the minimum time that we need to go from this neighborhood to that using xi 
it's uh, is ti and ti is of course non zero and ti is uh, and ti is uh, mm, finite because uh, there are no critical points if there there were some critical points the, the if the time were infinite then it would mean that there are critical points in between so ideally so what is the idea ideal situation ideally we reach ri in time ci minus epsilon minus a from every point. Okay, so if we reach ai from this and the time is the same, then we can say, well, over here, if we are here, we just say, okay, uh, the value of the function f will be like the average, the weighted average between the between ci minus epsilon and a. So here is a, here is ci minus epsilon. So this will be the average. Okay, and then well, let's say what is the uh, what was what would be the value of the function f somewhere here. Well, we look at the time. The value would be maybe a different color. So actually it's even better. If the time is exactly here, then we define the value of the function at the point P, F of P is equal A plus time to reach A. So from this is the, uh, to reach P from Mm, dn minus okay so if we if we reach ri in the, precisely this time then we said okay for any point p if i reach n minus below the level set ri so if the, the time is smaller then i define f of p to be the time needed to reach p from n minus okay so this is the ideal situation but there are two problems first of all this time is not constant. And there is a second problem, which is a bit more serious. Uh, a bit more serious problem is that uh, there might, there can happen that I have a neighborhood here and the vector field is really fast in this column. And I reach the critical, the, the neighborhood, this neighborhood in much shorter time than uh, than uh, than, uh, than in this time. So I say, well, okay, I, I would like to define the, the function r r f at this point as the time to reach, but uh, this is at this point I reach uh, imme almost immediately because my vector field is very 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 fast in here and rather slow in here. So what do I do? And there is a this is a technical question, and uh, it's uh, when you think about it for a moment, then it's uh, not that hard. Um, mm. You change the vector field. This is like, this looks like cheating. Well, and uh, it uh, is a bit of cheating. Uh, cheating means, uh, uh, because you would like to have the function f such that d psi f is positive away from crits. Okay, that was our aim. But now if you replace psi by phi psi for some function phi, and phi is from n to positive integers, and uh, even better if R phi is equal to one near each, each critical point, then you don't change the behavior of trajectories. If you remember from courses on ODEs, it's not a standard part of the course. This is called like weak equivalence of two dynamical systems uh, that you rescale the vector field and you can, this means that you preserve trajectories 
So the trajectories of the rescaled vector field um, the trajectories of the rescaled vector field are uh, the same as the trajectories of the original vector field, only you change the time to uh, that is needed to reach um, uh, that is spent on the trajectory. So you need you you don't change the route, you change the speed. So in particular, and this is like a standard question in the, in, in calculus, d phi psi f is equal to phi d psi f. So the differential, the directional differential is factorial. Uh, sorry, is C infinity linear with respect to the vector field psi. If you multiply psi by phi, the, uh, the differential is preserved. So you are in the proof, you are allowed to change psi to phi psi. Okay, so what do we do? We first rescale the vector field in AI or actually in a neighborhood of AI in such a way that we reach our eye precisely in that time. So what, how do we do that? We, I'm not giving you full details, but you change the, the vector field in this, uh, in, in this area by some, uh, by multiplying it by some function. That is like simple calculus that you can get the same time to reach from AI to R. And then after this, you can have like the fast columns. So the fast columns are the, the parts that, you, that it takes too short time to reach. And then you rescale near these columns. And then you don't change the function here because AI, once you have set the vector field in this like column to reach RI in precisely this, that time, then you don't reach in a neighbor. If you start from a neighborhood of AI, you never reach RI plus one much faster than RI. So you, in the second step, you don't change the function in the neighborhood. You don't destroy what you, what you improved in the previous step. So you rescale, you slow down the vector field to in this column. And again, this is like finding a, specific function phi. I will not give you the all the details, but then you define the function f in here. Okay, so I will repeat this argument in a moment. So because the second stage is that we start at a equals cp minus epsilon. Okay, so we are, here is n minus. Here is a critical point that touches the bottom and there are some other critical points. And now we want to extend the function and this is like the same story as we have, as we had before, but so there will be some repetitions that why I, that's why I didn't dwell too much time on the previous argument. We start at this point. We, the vector field, the neighborhood RP had this property that you can enter through it only in here and you can leave it only in here. Okay, so how you proceed? Well, we have our function defined in here and we slow down the vector field or rescale the vector field maybe in this neighborhood so that we slightly overlap over here so that the time so that in this region uh, when you start from this point you reach you don't reach uh, uh, you don't reach any other neighborhood uh, RP in a time smaller than CP plus epsilon. So you slow down the vector field over here 
and rescale sub and rescale the vector field in here also so that it's a, it matches so that the xi is equal to xi tf uh, sorry mm. rescaling in this region so for consistency uh, is Xi goes to um, Xi over D Xi F. So that the time, so that the vector field Xi is uh, precisely the time over in here, the time to reach this, this part is equal to one. Okay, so this is this is like a bunch of technical steps and um, you again define the function as the time uh, for um, you again define the function p f of p is equal to t plus c p minus epsilon where um, sorry f of z t is time to reach from n minus to z if t is less than two epsilon okay so if if z is not here if z is not too far away and then you extend the function to the next level set and then you proceed by induction you are in the first stage the first part over here and then you extend you are in the first situation that you have some space between the level set and the next next rp and then and then you proceed by induction and and the induction decreases the number of critical points in the uh, that are uh, such that that are between the um, the level sets of f where f is undefined so f is undefined and you shrink the neighborhood shrink 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 until you until there are no critical points so by extending you shrink the name the like the, the indeterminacy set of f until you reach the, the time where there are no critical points of uh, f in the uh, of xi in the region that f is not uh, not determined yet so that is like the final stage and uh, maybe uh, the details are harder to transmit or to convey them to figure out uh, by yourself if you if you need them so hereby i will declare the vector field integration as proved so i mentioned two results and the two results are uh, for specifying vector functions and uh, and uh, mm, specifying functions and specifying the mm, or simplifying fun Morse functions on the manifold. So we know that the Morse function on the manifold determines uh, somehow the topology of the manifold. We don't know it, don't know yet how deep can we go with this observation. So last week during classes uh, Giacomo uh, showed presented the proof that if a Morse function admit if a manifold if a closed manifold admits a Morse function with two critical points then it's necessarily uh, uh, homeomorphic to a sphere if a surface admits a Morse function with two critical points then it's necessarily rp2 and and so there are Mm. Mm. Uh, so there are like statements about that uh, that sim that if you have a simple Morse function, then your manifold well is supposed to be somehow simple. So sometimes the strategy that you want to uh, to to take is you have a fun you have a Morse function on some manifold, and you try to simplify this Morse function as much as you can. 
So there are like two ways to simplify. First of all, uh, how bad can be more a Morse function that is like, well, if you have a circle and you have a Morse function like this, then you have like a plethora of critical points. Even though the function, even though you work, uh, you uh, even though it's circle. So there are definitely many complex and very complicated Morse functions on simple manifolds. So how can we, how can we deal with this? Uh, Morse functions, first of all, we can like simplify in a way that this is a more simplified version of this Morse function. Well, the number of critical points should agree. And this means that the maxima, all the maxima are above the minima. So this is called the rearrangement. And there is another way. Well, we have a maximum and the minimum and we can like change this function by replacing it over here, okay? And we simplify the function by canceling a pair of critical points. So canceling a pair of critical points is a more complex operation than rearrangement. And uh, there are some sometimes obstructions for it. And this actually leads uh, that these are like a very thin door that lead you very deep to in the field of manifolds, but rearrangement is pretty simple. So what is the rearrangement theorem? Theorem rearrangement. And I will state it in a simple form. Uh, this simple form is equivalent to a more complex form, but the simple form is simpler to prove. Uh, and the best reference for that is Milner's lectures on H cobordism theorem. And in this is called, in Milner's, it's called elementary rearrangement. So suppose A is smaller than B and F from N to R is a Morse function. having Q0 and Q1 as its only critical points mm, only critical points in F inverse of AB. So we have like level sets AP and we have a critical point Q0 and Q1 and suppose that f of q naught is less of f q one. And there is an assumption. Well, there are no theorems without assumptions, unless you are in uh, expert in category theory. Oh, I deleted the point q naught. Let k not be the union of stable manifold of Q0, union the unstable manifold of Q0, intersected with F inverse of AB. So we have like the unstable manifold and we have like a stable manifold. And let K1 be the same and this will be green. Of course, mm, sorry, this
Okay, so this is K0 and K1. And there is an assumption. Suppose K0 and K1 are disjoint. So this is like a crucial point. The way we phrase it among people that work in more theory is that these two critical points do not talk to each other in mm, uh, in uh, in this interval in this between this level set. So they are they are like separate. They are like somehow independent. So there are no trajectories from Q0 to Q1 or Q1 to Q0. Uh, of course, this assumption is uh, important in the sense that in theory, you could have a situation like Q, Q0, Q1, and uh, like some Q2, and like, for example, the maximum of the function, and you have a trajectory from Q1 to, to the maximum, from Q0 to the maximum. So eventually, these uh, stable manifolds, or their closure, or at least, at, uh, or maybe the, their closures, they will eventually intersect. So that's why, that's why we replace here. Mm, uh, we put this, this assumption. So let me just copy this picture, because it's an important picture, and we will modify it. Uh, in a moment. So this is what I want to paste and this is what I want to erase. So this two should be erased and this, uh... okay, so here is the, the picture and then the statement. Then for any C in AB, there exists a Morse function F tilde equal to F away from a neighborhood of O, the neighborhood of Q naught. such that f tilde of q naught is equal to c. Or maybe I should keep this, uh, this parenthesis uh, open. What does, it, what does it mean? Let me just give you a, it means that I can shift the critical point up or down as I please, okay? I can lift the critical point Q0 above the critical point Q1. So there is like one um, uh, remark that I make this assumption, like make this geometric assumption that K0 and K1 are disjoint instead of creating the of making the assumption that uh, about the indices, because it's like more geometric. So once you understand the geometry, then you can separate the geometry from like topology or uh, sorry, from, al from algebra and from like dimension counting. So later on, the way you will use this theorem most, it will mostly be if the index of Q0 is smaller, is, is not smaller than the index of Q1. So that will be, but that's ne the next step of this of this story. So here is one thing I cheated. So if whenever I, I forgot, it's not cheating on purpose. If I cheat on purpose, I don't admit. To, uh, so I said the stable manifold, but the stable manifold is not something that is related to uh, mm, is not something that is related to mm, 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 wait sorry it's not something that's related to the function it's related to the vector field so i said if i'm saying that the 
stable manifold, I'm saying that there exists, suppose there exists a vector field eta that is, or sorry, xi, we were, we were using xi, xi such that xi is a gradient like vector field. Gradient like vector field. Okay, so this is like a statement. And there are like two, essentially, there are like uh, two proofs. Mm. Mm. Mm, of this theorem, and uh, I will give you one proof leaving uh, the other um, as uh, an exercise. So the, the proof that I can leave you as, as an exercise. Actually, it is, uh, it is the same proof. So. Start, take A to be a neighborhood of K not intersected with F inverse of A. So here is. Choose a set of points Xi mm. U in F inverse of A B such that Mm, what is the statement such that uh, the trajectory of Xi through U hits A, the closure hits uh, A Uh, I don't need. I don't need that. Sorry, I was. I was too fast. Uh, this is the the state. The theorem that I proved so so, so many times that I a. So here is a neighborhood of um, k not intersected with f inverse of a and b another neighborhood disjoint from uh, disjoint from k1 so a is in k uh, in sorry a the closure of a is in b and the closure of b is disjoint from k1 so here is k1 here is A and here is B is a bit small, bit is a bigger than A, but disjoint. Okay. And now choose a function uh, which is called mu to be the function such that um, mu is equal to one on A, mu is equal to zero away from B, and mu takes F inverse of A to R. So this is like a bump function. It's equal to one on the red region, and it's equal to zero away from the blue region. In particular, it's equal to zero on the on k1. Okay, so this is like a function that we define on a, and now we want to extend this function to a function on the whole of a b. Okay, so how do we do this? Do this? Well, extend mu to a
psi invariant function on mm, f inverse of AB. How do we do this? Well, this is like a method that we already met. So it's not hard to, uh, to, to imagine. We take a point. So let me just uh, maybe uh, what is the, the this was green so let me brown point u. I have a trajectory of xi, and this trajectory of xi can have like two properties. Either it hits in the infinite past, either I hit either in the past I hit the level set A, and then I set at the point like u prime, and then I declare u mu of u is equal to mu of u prime, or I am on an unstable manifold of q2 of q1, and then I declare mu of uh, u equals zero, or I am on an unstable manifold of q0, and the mu of u is equal to one. And this is a smooth function. Well, it's a smooth function uh, away from these unstable manifolds here because well of the because of the continuous dependence on the initial conditions. So that's like a standard argument. And there is uh, and on the other hand, mu is a smooth function also near these points because if I start near the near the very close to the stable manifold, to the unstable manifold, and I start going back, I will end up very close to the stable manifold of the, of the critical point. So if I start here, I go back, I reach a point that is near the, mm, near the stable manifold. That's also the, uh, that's also the, uh, uh, um, that's also the uh, the uh, mm, mm, that's also the mm, the smooth uh, dependence. On the other hand, if I start near the blue part, uh, if I start near the blue part, I choose the mm, I am mm, if I start at the near the blue part, I and I go back to the to the to the level set A. Well, if I start near near the deep dark blue part, I will end up near the blue part at the bottom. So if I start at the uh, at the unstable man near the unstable manifold of the critical point, then I end up at the near the stable manifold uh, stable, and the function is equal to one in here in the in the stable manifold. So it's. Uh, mm, mm. Uh, so the, the, the function is one in here and is equal. So if, if it's one in here, then it's good. So the function mu is well defined. Okay, so far so good. Now I want to define my new function f tilde. So my new function f tilde will be defined using f and uh, using f and uh, and mu. So what are the, there is an auxiliary function f. Choose psi from r2 to r. Psi or maybe r, r cross 0, 1 to r. Psi and my function f tilde is going to be uh, at the point u is going to be psi of f of u mu of u. So mu is somehow a parameter. So it's like a changing the parameter value of the function. So what do I want to have? Psi of x zero is equal to x. So if mu is equal to, mm, if mu is equal to, Mm, zero, then I don't change the function. So this means that I will not change the function. Uh, I will not change the function f near the 
near the um, uh, near the green part. So near k1, I don't I keep the function, and since uh, mu is equal to one near the blue part, I will change the function like in the neighborhood of the blue part of the unstable and stable manifold of q0. Okay, so first psi, then psi of x t is equal to x if x is less than a or x is greater or less or equal greater than b. This condition tells me that I don't change the function f below the level set a and above the level set b. So everything is kept, kept no matter what, no matter how t, what t is, I don't change the function f. Okay, so third condition is psi the map x to psi, and of course psi is a smooth function, so it's psi of x t is increasing for all t, and if psi Mm. And the last condition is the condition that we want to define something on one. Okay, so what happens for one? Psi of f of q not one is equal to c, and psi of f of q not plus s one is equal to c plus s for c sufficiently for sorry for s sufficiently small okay so the so there are like four conditions and uh, it's a quite simple task in in the calculus to draw this function, you can draw it now for your for yourself or draw draw the picture of this the graph of this function for various t. So, how should it work? Well, a b a b. This is psi x zero and psi of x one should be something like we have here and here, mm, maybe a plus epsilon b, b minus epsilon for some small epsilon, that's enough. And then we slow down and, or sorry, we, we want to raise. So we go this way, this way, and here is, So the function is supposed to be increasing, okay? So it's, but the point is that the slope in here, the slope in here and the slope in here, there are one. And here is uh, f of q naught and here is c. So here is b, here is b, okay? So this is like the graph of the function psi that is uh, that is uh, that is defined. We define this function psi, and actually, in some future applications, uh, you could even define a homotopy between the function psi and the the identity in such a way that you don't just create the function f tilde, but you create actually a family of function f tilde that lifts the critical value of q naught to the point q1. Anyway, we take this definition and we show that it's good. All right, so maybe uh, the first observation is that what is f tilde of q1? Well, mu of q1 is equal to zero. So f tilde of q1 is psi of 
f of q1 zero is f of q1. So actually near and the same holds near q1. What is f of q0? Is psi of f q0 one, and this is psi of f q0 well, plus c minus f q0, and f of u for u close to q0 is equal to psi of f of u one q0. So what is the meaning of this second line, it, of these slides? It means that we do not change the behavior of the function near critical points. So for example, we don't just not just change the critical value, we change the, we don't change the values of critical points, which means that the function had the same behavior up to a shift of, in the shift of the critical value. So these two terms, C minus F of Q naught are, are just constants. So for example, if I choose local Morse coordinates near Q naught, and the function was like sum of quadratic terms in these coordinates, then in these same coordinates, my function f tilde will be will have the same shape like quadratic terms plus a constant, but the constant is different. So this is the consequence, the consequence of this. Uh, oh, this is uh, not written the way I the way. Oh, it is written in the way it should be s plus c. Okay, this is a consequence of this of this condition. All right. So this is like a second, uh, like the statement, but now we would like to have to get that the function is, that this is a Morse, that F is in fact a Morse function. So for example, we, co we control the function near the critical points by these conditions. So this condition and that condition controls the function F near critical points, but we don't, we want to make sure that we don't create any new critical points. So how can we make sure? Take this formula and what I want to, show, and of course F tilde is equal to F on F inverse of AB. Okay, so that's something that we already know. So what is, how we control? Well, what is dx psi F tilde? And now this is a, an exercise in calculus. So dx psi of tilde is d psi over d, well, d x1 or d dx, multiply that d psi f plus d psi over dy, d psi mu. Okay, this is clear. This is like the chain rule for uh, different differentiating this function along a vector field. Okay, so now we use the trick. The trick is that d psi over dx is greater than zero. This is this statement. Okay, it's increasing. So this is greater than zero. Sorry, can I just check something? Yeah. Um, when you said f tilde is equal to f on f inverse of a, b, I thought that's where we were changing f tilde. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, yes, yes, sure, sure, sure. That's a good, good point. Away from. Okay, yeah. yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for that question. That's an important question. You would, uh, you would be extremely confused if you tried to understand what I meant, like in two weeks later. So d psi over dx is greater than zero. Okay. So what is d psi f? D psi f is greater than zero away from q naught and q1. So this term is positive. And how about this term? So any ideas about this term?
how can we control the other term, like d psi y times d psi, d psi mu? Isn't that d psi mu is usually zero? Yes. So Bart Bart uh, Bartome's uh, remark, if I correctly recognize the voice, yes? No. Yeah. Can it? Piotr, okay, Piotr's uh, remark. D psi mu is equal to zero because we declared the mu to be a psi invariant function. Mu is constant on trajectories of psi. So D psi mu is equal to zero. That was the, that is the point that we define the smearing function mu, like the control function mu. We started at the level set and we smeared it using the vector field uh, over the whole of F inverse of AB. So that's, so this term vanishes. So this is equal to D psi over DX, D psi F, and it's greater than zero away from mm, Q0 and Q1. And what is the meaning of this statement? Well, the meaning of it is that, that F tilde has no other critical points. Because if it had a critical point somewhere else than at Q0 or Q1, then the derivative, the directional derivative in any direction would be zero. Because that's the way, that's the critical point. Being a critical point means no matter in which direction you take the derivative, the, deriva the derivative is zero. But we showed that the d psi of tilde is non-zero away from a and b. So this means that we haven't created any new critical points. So that's like the end of the proof. But the proof is gives us one more thing. Xi, the vector field Xi is a gradient-like vector field, not only for F, but it's also the gradient-like vector field for F tilde. And this is an important state, an important remark. So in a sense, you keep the, the gradient-like vector field is expected to somehow control, give you a bit more control over the function. So you don't lose this control while, mm, mm, uh, while rearranging critical points. Okay, so far so good. So this is one proof. And the other proof that you can cook up by yourself is that you define a neighborhood RQ0 in here, a neighborhood RQ1 in here, and you have your function defined below and above, and then use vector field, and then the flow of the gradient like vector field goes, like the assumption that this K0 and K1 are disjoint tells you that there are no trajectories. You can choose these two neighborhoods in such a way that there are no trajectories from here to here. And then you use the vector field integration lemma. And then you define your function f via the same procedure as in the vector field integration lemma. That's the second proof. Actually, they are, this is the same proof phrased in a, in a different way. The original proof, so the Milner's proof, is better in the sense that it gives you a much more precise control over the uh, over the uh, over the function that you create. The, the the control is much more precise. Of course, the proof through the vector field integration lemma also gives you allows you to define uh, to show that psi is still the gradient like vector field for F tilde. Okay, so this is like the statement uh, that we had. And let me dwell for a moment over this uh, condition Q0 and Q1 are disjoint. Okay, so the rearrangement theorem is not complete or your understanding of the rearrangement theorem is not complete until you understand this condition. So how can we understand it? Suppose uh, 
H naught is the index of Q naught. H1 is the index of Q1. And the dimension of N is N. All right? So, the dimension of a stable manifold of Q0 is equal to H0. That's the definition of the index. The definition of the, the dimension of the unstable manifold is N minus H0. The dimension of the stable manifold Q1 is H1 and the dimension of the unstable manifold of Q1 is N minus H1. So if we are on the picture like Q0, Q1, and f of q0 is smaller than f of q1, then among these four manifolds, only two can intersect, except for the critical point, except at critical points. Which manifolds can, it, can possibly intersect? Any ideas? Which of the four manifolds, WSQ0, WSQ1, WUQ0, and WUQ1, can possibly intersect? So remember that K0 was K1 was Any ideas which um, which manifolds can possibly intersect? I think stable and unstable. Stable and, uh, yeah. Okay. Of course, two unstable manifolds are disjoint because two stable manifolds are disjoint. Because if you have a critical, uh, you have a point, then it reaches one critical point. It can't reach the other critical point because it reaches only one. So it can be a, a point can belong to only one stable manifold of some critical point. So these two are disjoint. These two are disjoint. If f of k naught is smaller than f of q1, then you cannot start at q1 and end up at, end up at q naught. Okay, because if you start at q1, you go up, and to go to k naught, you are mm, you go you need to go down. So the stable manifold of q naught and this are disjoint. The only possibility of having something that is not disjoint is uh, this intersection, okay? So the main idea is to use the some sort of the dimension counting argument. For example, if you have two lines, uh, okay, so let me just ask a general question. Who knows what is transversality? Who has, whom you can answer either on chat or uh, by ra raising hand, or you can answer, uh, you can say that you, uh, uh, you, can, you can just say, who knows what is uh, transversality? I, I, I do. Okay. I think I do. Okay. I also think I do. Okay, three of three out of seven. Okay, anybody else? A little. I also do. Okay, so five. Okay, so let me just give you a quick, uh, a quick review, quick recalling. I will not refer to. I will not. Um, give uh, full details. If you need full details on transversality, my favorite my favorite tool, my favorite source is Arnold's second book on ODEs. 
So Arnold wrote a handbook on ODEs, which is so-so, but he wrote also a book that is additional chapters uh, on uh, uh, ordinary differential equations uh, in Polish teoria równań różniczkowych, in Russian dopełnitelne głowy obyktowiennych differentiujemych urawnieni. This is a book which uh, has, it's not a good book to learn something from, to read it from, from the beginning to the end, but there are some chapters of the book. For example, if you want to learn blow up, it's definitely not a good place to learn. But if you want to learn transversality theory, it's my favorite. So you learn transversality theory in a language that is uh, very good. Mm. So what is transversality? Like a quick review. Uh, if you have a line, two lines at mm, 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 two lines, uh, if you have two lines in R3, then they can intersect, they can't, can't intersect. But if they intersect, then you can move slightly one of them so that they don't intersect. So if you have like two manifolds, uh, two like planes, hyperplanes in the in a big ambient linear space, and the sum of dimensions is smaller than the dimension of the of the um, uh, of the ambient manifold, then they don't intersect. Or if they intersect, you can slightly move them so that uh, so that they don't intersect. Okay. The formal definition of transversality is more complex, but the way we use it here is just if something satisfies transversality, then uh, the, if some manifolds like intersect transversally, then the dimension of the intersection can be counted by the, the, the intersection of these two manifolds is a manifold and the dimension of the manifold is as you expect. So that's the, like the, the first approximation to the notion of transversality. And uh, so that's, uh, in particular, if they are, if the sum of dimensions of the manifolds is smaller than the dimension of the manifold, then they don't intersect. So uh, more, and the other thing is that transversality is in general an open dense condition by what, by what I mean, that if we find, uh, if some manifolds don't intersect transversally, we can perturb one of them in such a way that it starts intersecting transversally. So I will come back to that uh, uh, explanation, maybe more while studying um, more complex singularities, but now let me just Say what do I want to say? Well, you would like to see that the dimension of the intersection, like naive approach, they will tell you naive, and then I will tell you something that is uh, not naive. Naive application of transversality. If W U If n minus q naught, q h naught plus h one is smaller than n, then and h zero, uh, sorry, and v s q one is transverse to w q naught then is disjoint from WUQ not. Okay, that's the naive approach. Why it is naive? Well, because it omits, it neglects one observation that this set is Xi invariant. This set is Xi invariant. If you have any intersection between these two objects, then you have the whole trajectory of intersections. So the intersection of these two guys 
can never be zero dimensional. It can have only one dimension, one or more, or more. So what is the proper approach? We take the critical point Q naught and the proper And then this is the unstable of Q0, and this is the stable of Q1. And then we choose a non critical level set. Non critical level set. And then now let me call A equal w u of q naught intersected with f inverse of c. Then the dimension of a is one less than the dimension of w u. Okay, because we that's again transversality in the sense that the w u is transverse to this to this uh, to the critical level. So but it's like somehow obvious that the dimension is will have a manifold that flow that is invariant you intersect it then there are no tangencies it's uh, one dimensional less. So this is like n minus one minus h naught. Let's say b. So this is like a is in here, b is in here, b is the stable manifold of q1. Then the dimension of b is n minus one, sorry, is H1 minus 1. The dimension of is equal n minus 1. So if A is transverse to B and H0 is greater or equal than H1, not just greater, from this naive approach from last slide, we would get greater. Now we get greater or equal. Then a and B form an empty set. Okay. So this means that, what does it mean? If this is empty, then this is empty too. The intersection of the stable and unstable, because if they are, if they are, if there exists at least, if there exists an element in the intersection of this guy and that guy, it means that there is a trajectory from Q0 to Q1, because a, an element in this intersection is a point such that it reaches Q1 in the infinite future and Q0 in the infinite past. So there is there exists a whole trajectory from Q0 to Q1. If there exists a whole trajectory, then it has to this trajectory has to intersect the any non-critical level set in between. That's, that's standard. So if A and B are intersect trivially, so if this and that intersect trivially, then the whole manifolds intersect trivially. So this leads us to the following definition. A gradient like, and this is the power of vector field psi is called Morse smale. So this is a Morse smale condition. If for any two crits Q not Q1, the manifolds WU of Q0 and WS of Q1 intersect, sorry, intersect transversely. And there is a theorem that I will prove next week. Any gradient like vector field can be perturbed 
to a Morse smell gradient like vector field. So this is, is going to what I go what I will prove next week. And now the statement is that the consequence will be very far reaching. It means that if I have two critical points, Q0 and Q1, and no critical points in between, and the index of Q0 is greater than the index of Q1, I can always find the gradient like vector field that is more small so that there is no trajectory from Q0 to Q1. So I can use the elementary arrangement, rearrangement theorem to lift this critical point above. So I can always, if, my, if I have two critical points such that the critical value of the one with higher index is smaller than the critical value of the other, I can always rearrange, which means that I can make the critical function, the critical value of, of a critical point with higher index uh, higher than below. Uh, higher than uh, higher than the, the other, and this means that I can like somehow rearrange critical points. That is like inductive procedure, but it's pretty straightforward now. That I can always make sure that my all all of my critical points are uh, uh, are rearranged in such a way that higher higher order critical points are higher than lower uh, higher index critical points have pre higher critical values. Okay. So thank you for now. If there are any questions, I stop recording.